Would you pray with me uh, before we enter God's word today? Father, we thank you that you are a God that offers us rest. In fact, you invite us into it. So Jesus, we pray that we would experience again the completed work that you accomplished on our behalf and that we would find our fulfillment, our rest in you. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. I, I don't think for most of us that it comes as much of a surprise that we live in a culture that values stuff. It, we, we value the acquisition of more. In fact, oftentimes, I think subconsciously and, and, and sometimes even rather overtly, we assign value to people based on their ability to gather stuff and the quality of the stuff that they've gathered around them. The, the pursuit of more in our culture, our modern society, is really something of a religion. In the United States alone, we, we live in and own some of the largest homes in the world. Only Australia has more square footage per capita than the United States does. And yet, even with all that space, the United States is the largest occupier of storage rental units. In fact, just in the United States alone, there's nearly 1.8 billion square feet of rentable storage space. Just so for some context here, that means that we could house under the roof of our storage units every man, woman, and child in America with six square feet for each of us. Even on top of, of all of that, when we are doing our online shopping, oftentimes if you're purchasing something on Amazon or some other website, you're about to make the purchase and underneath there, there's a box that says frequently uh, bought together items. Right? Even as you're adding more to your life, they're selling to us and it's, they're good at it. It works. We love the pursuit of more. We need more. The pursuit of more is, is our religion, then, then work is our worship. Achievement and accumulation are spiritual disciplines, and then the notion of ceasing, of stopping, of pressing pause on our striving is a sin. Last week, we began a four-week teaching series entitled The Rhythm of Rest, where we're exploring the idea, the command, the invitation into Sabbath that Scripture offers us and asking ourselves, what does this look like in a modern technological culture? I think what, what was obvious for me, and, and maybe for you as well, was just how counterculture this invitation into rest really is. In so many ways, it feels foreign to us. For example, last week when Pastor Brian was teaching, at the very end of the sermon, he invited us into a Sabbath experiment where we would just set aside time, intentional time, to cease our working, to put our cell phones down, to close our computers, to just be present with God, to notice him in our lives and around us, to take a walk, to just to breathe in and to experience his presence. Many of us, including myself, Sunday after church, I, I went home with my family. We enjoyed a lunch. We're all sitting around the kitchen island together and we, we kind of dove into this experiment. We put our cell phones on the, the kitchen island after lunch, face down, so we wouldn't be distracted. We turned off all the TVs, and we sat there for a moment. And then we all kind of looked at each other with blank stares as if to say, now what? Like, how, how do we rest? Like, what do we need to do to, to experience Sabbath? And of course, my family is, is looking at me because I had just preached on this and I, I didn't have a great answer for them in that moment. 
Like I, I could feel internally the tension and the unease in just setting aside specific time to be still and rest in God. As if my mind and my body were saying, is, is this time well spent? Are you allowed to do this? I think there's a reason for this. In addition to our, our inability or our lack of, of practicing the Sabbath, this neglect that I think is, is pervasive in our culture, and I and I'm absolutely include myself in that, I think the, in addition to that, we feel this, we experience this because, because the Sabbath is, is meant to be, it's intended to be subversive. Because when we experience Sabbath, when we experience rest, when we enter into that, what we discover are kingdoms in conflict. Kingdom of, of this world, the physical world, the ac- uh, accumulation of, of more achievement, pursuing work, all of it versus the kingdom of God that Jesus enters into where he himself describes it as, as rest. So in our time today, I want to dig into this a bit more. We're going to turn to Exodus chapter 20. You almost uh, know this as the, the, the passage where God delivers the Ten Commandments to the people of Israel. And so it's familiar with us in, in a lot of ways. But it's even the idea of this being a, the Ten Commandments is interesting. One person suggests we treat this more like nine commandments and one really strong suggestion. Right? If you look at most of these, and we will here momentarily, if I were dealing with and, and um, acting out in conflict with these commandments, at the very least, it, was, it would require a, a conversation to say, okay, Sterling, we got to get some things right, or, or far more. Um, it could require, would ultimately result in me getting fired. But if, if I ignore the Sabbath, if I totally ignore the idea of rest, nobody confronts me on that. In fact, more often than not, you're, you're going to get applause for that. People will look at you and say, look how hard you work. I think it speaks to the fact that, that we're missing something here. Exodus chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. It says, And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So from the very outset here, what we discover is God establishes everything that he's about to give his people and who he is and what he's done for them. Verse 3 now, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or your daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigners residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. 
And when the people saw the thunder and, and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Again, as, as we read these verses together, and they may have a familiar ring to you, you may have memorized these when, when you were a kid, but when you read that in the context there, you don't get the sense that, that God is giving these as mere suggestions. In fact, when we take this in the context of, of God freeing the people out of Egypt, as one person put it, we shouldn't think of these merely as 10 commandments, but 10 keys to living in freedom. And there's a couple observations that I want us to consider here when we think about the subversive nature of the Sabbath. And the first is simply that the Sabbath is to be remembered. The Sabbath is to be remembered. Every command that God gives us here starts with, you shall or you shall not. Except for, he says, just goes right in to honor your father and mother, but it's implied you shall honor your father and mother. Except for the Sabbath. Except for the command to rest. That, in that command, we are instructed to remember. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know for you if you have one of those, those habits or behaviors in your life that seem to have like a gravitational pull on you that seem to just draw you back, even if you've made commitments in the past or you want to start a new tradition or whatever it is, you just sort of like are drawn back to those things. I, uh, I had the opportunity to take one of those um, personality tests that's supposed to help you understand how you're wired and kind of areas of strength and areas of weakness and all that sort of thing. And in the assessment, one of the things that, that it designated for people that share my personality type was addictions. And under the addiction section, it it read, you're prone under stress to, um, to have a tendency to stress eat. And then it said, especially on sweets and carbohydrates. It was like, how'd they know? I mean, I was, that was exactly right. Like, I, I, I know that about myself. I have that, that gravitational pull. Here in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 the Lord reminds us to remember the Sabbath day. He instructs us to remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. It's as if God understood that, that the people of Israel had a gravitational pull that was taking them away from the truth of who he was and what he had done. And so do we. So in, in response, because God loves us, because he gives us good gifts, he created this weekly experience where we once again come into, we enter that truth in order to be grounded in Sabbath rest. Again, God knowing that, that our tendency would be to forget. Our tendency would be to, to be pulled away from that truth of who he is and, and what he has accomplished on our behalf. He says, remember the Sabbath day. It's, it's given to you. He, he built it in into the rhythm of creation itself. And he's saying, I don't want you to, I don't want you to neglect this. I don't want you to forget to experience it. I think it would be interesting if, if we had time to just kind of comb through scripture and to explore all the moments when, when the people of God are instructed to remember. I, I, I think what we would discover, and I, I, I've started to test this a little bit and look at some of the passage. I think what we would discover in that each of these instances, this, this instruction, this call to remember is given as a remedy or as an antidote against some gravitational pull that God knows his people are going to experience away from him. 
He gives it to us in, in order for, to, to bring us back, to ground us in the truth that we would continue to live in the freedom that he has provided for us. When Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples, Luke chapter 22, he took a piece of bread, something they were very familiar with. They'd, they had taken Passover their entire life. He, he took a cup of wine and he said, when, when you take this, when you eat this, I want you to remember me. Because he understood that, that their tendency would be to forget grace. That they would be prone, as we are, to revert back to this system of living that operates out of some desire on our part to earn our acceptability before God. So God, in his grace and mercy, he, he gave them, he gives us something tangible, something we hold in our hands to remind us that, that we're free from that striving. We experience that. When we come to the Lord's table, we experience that when we intentionally and purposefully come into Sabbath rest. Remember the Sabbath day by, by keeping it holy. Another subversive component, another, another aspect of Sabbath that fights back against this, this cultural religion that we experience of accumulation and achievement of more is the fact that the Sabbath is for everyone. The Sabbath is for everyone. I remember the very first time I, I flew as a kid. My parents were taking my brothers and I out to California to, to visit a couple of my aunts and uncle and some of my cousins that lived out there and we were incredibly excited. And as I walked on the plane, uh, my eyes got big. Because as you know, when you walk on the plane, you first come to, to first class. And those seats are filled, but they, people are getting warm towels and there's cookies and the seats were, were gigantic and, and comfortable. And I just looked at it and I thought, this is going to be amazing. And then I, I walked past all those seats. And I walked to the seats where we were sitting and I quickly began to realize that that what was up there wasn't for me. And to be frank, at the time, I, I didn't care that much. I was really excited about where we were going and what we were go going to be doing. But, but we all know that feeling of seeing something out there and recognizing that this isn't, this isn't for me. Or seeing something, conversely, that, that we might have and say, well, that's, that's not for them. Look again, again in Exodus 20, in verse 9. It says, Six days you shall labor and, and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your servant, your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your town. This is... This is this is entirely countercultural in the ancient Near East. Again, when we, when we hear these verses, we got to keep this in mind to, to how this started all the way back in verse 2, where again reminds this, this law is given, and it's given from the context of who God is and what he's done. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Rest, when, when the people of Israel were slaves in Egypt, was, was for the elite. Rest was, was for Pharaoh. That's what he did. And rest was the very thing that, that Pharaoh withheld from them. We look at the, the people of God in Egypt in Exodus chapter 5. Rest is the very thing that, that Pharaoh holds back from, from the people of Israel. Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh and they ask him for permission to take the people out into the wilderness where they will have um, a festival and offer sacrifices to God and, and, and to rest, to, to Sabbath. And this is Pharaoh's response. This is Exodus 5, 17 and 18. This is part of his response. The whole thing sort of goes on like this. Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are, lazy. 
That's why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You will not uh, be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. Like you, can, you can see the contrast of kingdoms here. What God is offering to his people in freedom in contrast to what this human empire, this human pharaoh demands of them. And there's two things I want, us to, I want us to hear in there. I want us to hear invitation and I want us to hear responsibility. God is, and make no mistake about this, God is saying this is for you. I'm giving this to you. Don't, don't forget it. Don't neglect it. Because when you do so, you are returning to an experience that oppressed you. You're returning to an experience where, where rest was withheld from you. He says, on it, on the Sabbath day, don't do any work. It's, it's given to them. It's given to us. It's given to you. But it's not only given to you. It's not just for you. He goes on, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. The, the Sabbath is given to us. It's an invitation, but it is also given to us as a responsibility to provide for those under our care and leadership. I, I've been processing this in, in kind of two categories this week. And those I, I work with, those that I have the opportunity to lead, and those that I live with. And just wrestling with that question, am I, am I creating space, am I creating opportunity for them to experience rest? But not only am I creating it, am I leading them into it? Am I, am I taking them to a place of rest? I asked my staff at the Mill Creek campus this just this week. So we talked to this, and how do we hold each other accountable to this? How do we create this for each other? How do I do that as a leader? Are we, are we offering our kids the, the same religion of accumulation and accomplishment that we so often find ourselves beholden to? Are we teaching them? that their value and that their worth is measured in a GPA or their success, their success on a, a soccer field or what, what chair they've achieved in the orchestra. We, we have a responsibility. Okay, I'm like all the rest of you. I, I want my kids to achieve their full potential. I, I want them to be successful, but more than that, I want them to be whole. I want them to know that, that their God is crazy about them, that he, he wants to be with them, and that there's nothing that they need to do to earn that. There's nothing that they need to achieve or accomplish. There's no performance they need to give. They can come to him and rest in him. I, I need to lead them to that. There's a, a tradition in, in Jewish homes where at the beginning of Sabbath, the, the father will take a spoon for each of the children and he would dip it in honey so that his kids would grow up with the idea and the experience of the sweetness of Sabbath, of coming into the Sabbath. The Sabbath is for everyone. And make, make no mistake, the, the Sabbath is costly. To do this requires sacrifice, but, but it has always required us letting go of lesser things in order to take hold of something greater. And then thirdly, when we're talking about the subversive nature of Sabbath, we discover in the fact that Sabbath is an act of resistance. Sabbath is an act of resistance. In, in the book of Deuteronomy, the Ten Commandments are repeated. But what's different is that the audience is, is the second generation. 
When God speaks the commandments in Exodus, it's, it's the people that were led out of Egypt. When he speaks them in Deuteronomy, he's giving them to their children. They were born in the wilderness, not in Egypt. In fact, flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 12. It says, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And on it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Notice in verse 15, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with his mighty hand and outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. See, in, in, in Exodus, when God speaks the commandments to his people. Sabbath is rooted in the rhythm of creation. In Deuteronomy, it's an act of resistance. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out with a mighty hand in his outstretched arm. Every, every human empire that has ever existed has been built on the hu- accumulation of more. Whether it was the ancient empires of Egypt and Babylon and Rome or the the world that we live in right here and right now. It's built on the religion of more. But what God gives his people in his word in this invitation into Sabbath is he's saying, don't forget that you were slaves at one point in time in your life to the God of more. Sabbath rest is is an overt act of resistance. It's a refusal to enter into this system that has built our meaning and our purpose around the idea that the more we accumulate, the more we have, the more we accomplish, the more worthy we are, the more acceptable to God we should be. It's subversive to the demands of a world that requires us to offer worship through our never-ceasing work. Sabbath steps on, it smashes every idol in our modern American culture. Productivity, achievement, accumulation, accomplishment, all of it. Sabbath, when practiced routinely as the gift that God intended to be, uh, the, the gift that God intends it to be, breaks our addiction to more. John Mark Comer, a pastor out in Portland, said it this way. He says, it's not only an act of resistance against Pharaoh and his system. It's an act of alignment with Yahweh and his. The Apostle Paul describes it this way. He says, don't be conformed to the patterns of this world. Don't, Don't be conformed. Don't be shaped. Don't enter into... The, the patterns that this world seek to press on you, but resist it. Rather, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Sabbath is, is given to us as a subversive act against a pattern of this world that seeks to enslave. And it's given to us as an invitation into the freedom that God has already accomplished on our behalf. There's, a, there's an experiment that, that is sometimes practiced in, in behavioral psychology classes. Students in the, in the class are given a lab rat, and their objective is to be able to train the lab rat to press a bar in order to get water. And so they'll begin, and, and, and they'll start by making sure that that their lab rat has gone without water for 24 hours, so it's thirsty. And then when it gets near to the water, the student presses the bar and the lab rat gets something to drink. And he continues this process until the lab rat eventually figures out to press the bar themselves. And 
and they acquire the water. And then they'll train the lab rat to, to press the bar twice before they get the water. And then 10 times. And then 100 times. And, and, and 1,000 times. In fact, you, you could eventually train the lab rat to keep pressing that bar in order to get the water until it actually exhausts itself and dies from dehydration. You see, we live in a world that, that teaches us to just keep pressing that bar. That the, the promise of more will satisfy. The promise of more will give purpose and meaning if we just keep pressing the bar. But we worship a God who invites us to stop. To rest. To know that, that in him we're full that we have everything that we need. This week, um, we've been setting up as a part of this series, we, we've been talking about ways to experience this, or Sabbath experiments. And last week, we just invited you to take time aside, set it aside for intentional, purposeful rest. And I hope you did that. And I, I hope that you experienced that. And if not, I invite you to do that this week. But I want to I want to add something to this. And you'll find these. There's journals online. I think they're on your app as well where we give you ideas or ways to experience Sabbath rest on a, on a spiritual, on a mental, on a physical, on an emotional level as a part of this series. But I just want to add something to that this week. This week, I would, I would love for you as an individual or as a family to just take 24 hours that you mark out and, and don't buy anything. Don't add anything to your life. But simply set aside time to, to enjoy what it is that you have, what you already possess, and our God who, who is our everything. Set aside the acquisition of more in Sabbath rest because it is subversive, because it fights against the pattern of this world that is pressing down on us, that is oppressive, and that God has, has um, defeated through his work on the cross. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come again into your word. We thank you that, that when we read your law, we discover that this is, this is not a heavy hand that you seek to press on us. These are these are the tools, the way that you give us to live in freedom. God, forgive us for, for when we've neglected that. Forgive us when we have forgotten to rest in you. Lord, we desire again to be with you, to enter into your presence, and to know that we are full because what you have accomplished on our behalf. Amen. Go today in the knowledge that your God invites you into his Sabbath rest. And in him you have everything that you need. Amen.